Hello friends at Bible Baptist. Greetings from Northwest Arkansas and coming to you from uh, Gospel Light Baptist Church here in Rogers. And my name's Taylor Gillespie. I know many of you, uh, but Brother Pearson asked if I would record a few devotions and send them over y'all's way and try to be an encouragement to the church. And so I said, absolutely, I'd love to do that. And so I want to speak to you uh, from 1 Samuel chapter number 16. And I've been studying and meditating on this passage. So I'm going to share a few uh, just encouraging and even challenging thoughts from this passage that I, I believe will be a, a help and encouragement to you. And I trust you all are doing well. And I know we've been locked down in quarantine for a number of weeks now. And as things begin to slowly uh, return back to normal, uh, we anticipate that. Uh, but while we're still, uh, some of us can find at home, I hope that uh, God's word will be an encouragement to your heart. So 1 Samuel chapter number 16. And when you come to the chapter here, we it opens up in verse number one uh, with an old man that is mourning. Uh, he's grieving. He's crying. In fact, you'll find the word mourn there in verse number one. And it means to mourn for someone who has died. So this is heavy mourning. This is deep grief. And notice what the Bible says in chapter 16, verse 1, And the Lord sent unto Samuel, the man that's mourning is Samuel. You remember, he was the last of the judges. Uh, he's an old man now. And the Lord said unto Samuel, How long wilt thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning uh, over Israel. And here Samuel is mourning over Saul. And if you were to go back several chapters, uh, you'll remember how God's people, Israel, came to Samuel and said, Samuel, we want a king. We want to have a king like everybody else. We, we want to be like all the other nations around us. We want to be like everybody else. We know that God is in heaven, uh, but we want a king that you can see here on earth. We want a king. And so Samuel goes to the Lord and says, Lord, they want a king. And uh, the Lord says to Samuel, okay, give them what they want. And so the people chose for themselves a king. And that first king was Saul. And Saul was tall, dark, and handsome. I mean, he looked like a king. He carried himself like a king. I mean, he was king material uh, based on his appearance. And uh, he started off well. He was very humble. He knew how to uh, rally the people together and get the army together. Uh, but unfortunately, he began to rebel bell uh, against the Lord. And after that third sin, that third act of rebellion, uh, the Lord said, you're done. And the Lord rejected him from being king. And, uh, and, 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 and finally you come here. And of course, it's chapter 16, verse number one now. And, and Samuel is mourning over that. He's mourning over Saul. And I think it'd be safe to say that Saul was a was a big disappointment. And uh, here he's uh, Samuel's mourning over uh, that. And can I just say in life, a disappointment is a part of life. Uh, you're going to be disappointed from time to time. And uh, most of the time, our disappointments are with people. Uh, disappointment is an unmet expectation. And you had a certain expectation and somebody did not meet that expectation and it resulted in disappointment. Can I just say that people are going to disappoint you? Hey, family, Family sometimes will disappoint you. Friends will sometimes disappoint you. Uh, people at church will disappoint us. Uh, most of all, we're going to disappoint ourselves from time to time. And when you and I experience disappointments in our life, it's normal and it's natural and it's even healthy to mourn and to grieve over those disappointments. Uh, but can I say this? We can't mourn forever. And uh, that's kind of what's taking place here in verse number one. And so uh, the Lord asked Samuel, how long? Long are you going to mourn over Saul? And uh, in other words, the, 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 the implication from the question is this. Samuel, you, you need to stop mourning and start moving. You need to stop grieving and start going. Listen, it's okay to mourn and grieve, but we can't mourn forever. And the Lord was about to reveal to Samuel, he says, I know that you're disappointed, but I want you to know that I have a plan. And Samuel is really panicking and thinking, well, who, who's going to lead us and who's going to be our king? And, and Saul was not who we thought he was going to be. And uh, what? Uh, in fact, Israel is, is even spiritually not 
in a good condition. What are we going to do? And can I say, in spite of his disappointment, God had a plan. And today, you may be facing a disappointment in your life. You may be disappointed over a circumstance or a situation over a, a person in your life. Listen to me. God has a plan. And notice the last phrase in verse number one. God says, for I have provided me a king among his sons. Listen, a man panics, but God provides. And God tells Samuel, listen, I've already provided me a king. I want you to grab your horn, uh, horn and fill it up with oil. I want you to go to Bethlehem and go to Jesse's house because I've already provided for me a son, a king among one of his sons. One of his sons will be the next king. Well, he grabs the horn of oil and says, okay, I got it. And in verse number two, he says, wait a second, how, how can I do this? If uh, Saul uh, catches me going to anoint the next king, uh, he, he, he's going to take my lives. And so there was great fear. And so again, he panics. And so the Lord says, here, just take a heifer with you and uh, go to Bethlehem. And if anybody stops you along the way, just tell them you're going to sacrifice in Bethlehem. Well, finally, he shows up in Bethlehem and even the people come out in verse number four and they say, come us now peaceably. I mean, they were panicked as well. There's fear all across the land. And so in verse number five, uh, Samuel says, I come peaceably. And he gathers Jesse's family together and says, we're going to have a sacrifice. And so Jesse calls his sons in, uh, seven of his sons, and uh, there they gather around the sacrifice. And I can just imagine uh, Jesse's looking at them and Samuel's looking at them. The sons are looking at each other and uh, they don't know what's going on. Uh, and Samuel's there and he knows he's there to anoint the next king, but he doesn't know which of the sons is going to be the next king. And so the first one comes out and it's Eliab. And he comes out and in fact, notice the Bible says in verse six, and it came to pass when they were come that he looked on Eliab and said, surely this, uh, the Lord's anointed is before him. And boy, he looked at Eliab and here Here's a young man that's tall, dark, and handsome, and uh, he looks uh, much like Saul, like king material. And so uh, Samuel thinks to himself, surely this is the next king. I mean, he looks like a king. He sounds like a king. He carries himself like a king. I mean, he, he had been prepared for battle in chapter 17. He's out on the battlefield. And so Samuel thinks, surely this is the next king of Israel. But notice what God says in the next verse, verse number seven. But the Lord said unto Samuel, look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as as man seeth, for the man for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. God says to Samuel, Samuel, I don't see people the way that you see people. Uh, when I when you look at a man, you see his height, you see his stature, you see his face, you see his appearance, you see his image. But when I look on a man, I see past the appearance and I see past the image and I see past the way that he looks and I see deeper than that. I can see his character and I can see the condition of his heart. And I want you to know that Eliab may look impressive to you and he may have uh, appear to have a good image, but I want you to know there's some there's some things going on in in Samuel uh, that 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 uh, in Eliab, uh, and as a result of his character, uh, he's not the next king of Israel. And uh, in fact, you go to chapter 17 and we find out that Eliab was negative and he was critical and he looked down on David. And so uh, the Lord says he's not the next king. And so the next one comes out, the next son, and that's Abinadab. And sure enough, uh, same thing. Uh, he too was tall, dark, and handsome. He looked like a king. He carried himself like a king. And once again, Samuel thought to himself, surely this is the Lord's anointed. But then the Lord informs him, uh, no, this is not the next king. Well, he goes to the next son. The next son is Shammah. And sure enough, the same thing. He looks impressive. His appearance uh, looks like a king. But And uh, uh, Samuel says once again, surely this is the Lord's anointed. He thinks to himself. And for the third time, the Lord says, no, this is not the next king. And in fact, they go through all seven of the sons. And every one, the Lord says, that's not him. That's not him. That's not him. That's not him. 
And uh, finally, he gets down to the end, and Samuel uh, is exasperated, and he says, Jesse, do, do, do you have any more sons left? And uh, Jesse says, well, now that I think, yeah, I got one more, uh, but he's the youngest, and he's out there keeping uh, the sheep. And so, listen, I don't know if Jesse fully understood what was going on that day, uh, but, but, but let's say that he did. And if he knew that Samuel was there to anoint the next king, really what he was saying was, yes, I have one son, but he is he is so, uh, if you're looking for a candidate to be the next king, it's going to be one of these seven sons that I have here. It certainly won't be the one that I got out there keeping the sheep. I mean, it certainly won't be my youngest son. I mean, out of all my sons that'll be, that, that, that could be the next king, my youngest son, the one out there keeping the sheep, is the most unlikely candidate to be the next king. In fact, when he was calling in the rest of the sons, uh, he said, uh, he, uh, when he called in his sons for the sacrifice, he considered uh, David so insignificant, or maybe he just forgot about him altogether, but he didn't even call Jesse in, uh, Jesse, Jesse didn't even call David in to be a part of the sacrifice. And so David was certainly so lowly estimated in the eyes of his own family and considered so unlikely that he was not even called to the sacrifice. Uh, but Jesse was about, and the rest of the family was about to receive the surprise of his life. And uh, can I say this about God's choices when it comes to, uh, to uh, the people that God chooses? And that's really what we're dealing with in this passage. When it comes to the people that God chooses, God's choices are surprising. And uh, so they call in they, they call in David. Someone goes to get David. In fact, Samuel said, I'm not going to leave until I lay eyes on him. Somebody go get that young man. And they ran out there and called out into the fields. They said, hey, hey, David, come on inside. Uh, come into the house. They want you. And so they called David in. And uh, he walks in, of course, just a teenage young man. And it smells like sheep. Uh, but he walks into the house there. And uh, when, when, when Samuel sees David, uh, the Lord says, this is if this is the next king. And he says, I want you to anoint him. And so the old man, Samuel, hobbles across the room and takes the oil and puts it on, pours it on just, uh, David's head. And uh, the text doesn't tell us, but I believe that he leaned over to it and whispered in his ear, David, you're going to be uh, the next king. Well, let me tell you something. Uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the Lord's choices are so surprising. It's surprising in who God chooses to use and who God doesn't choose to use. And I tell teenagers at camp this all the time. I, I'll say, you, you don't understand this now, uh, but 10, 15, 20 years from now, you're going to look back and you're going to remember and think about the people uh, you went to church with or you were raised up in the youth group with or you went to a Christian school with. And I said, you're going to be surprised 20 years from now at who, God's, who God uses and who God doesn't use. And so often we get enamored by maybe a young person Person who is, is well-spoken and has a good appearance and carries himself well and, uh, and, and may be spiritual. We, we look at that young person and say, well, uh, that uh, boy, God's going to use that young person and they're going to go far for God and God's going to use them a great way. I mean, they, they just uh, appear to be a young person that will be used by God. Listen to me, you may be surprised. Yet, on the other hand, there may be a young person in the youth group that is shy and introverted and backwards and doesn't have very good social skills. And we look at that young person and say, well, oh, uh, God, God will never use that young, that young person will never do anything for God. Listen, you may be surprised. God's choices are surprising. And here we find that God bypasses all the other sons, and yet he chooses the most unlikely candidate, and that young person was, was David. Now listen, on the surface, there would appear to be nothing impressive about David. Uh, there was nothing that uh, we think would have uh, attracted God to him, or, or God would have been impressive to God on the surface. But when we begin to dig into this passage, we find, and, and there's some phrases and some clues here that really reveal the inner qualities that David possessed, and I believe those were the reasons why God chose David to be the next king of Israel. And I think when we look at those qualities, we'll also answer the question, what kind of people does God choose today? What kind of people 
does God choose to use? And I want to give you the first point of this video, and then we'll look at the next two in the next two videos. But the first reason that I believe that God chose David to be king was this, was because he was spiritual. He was spiritual. In fact, when you go back to chapter number 13, and Samuel is talking to Saul and says, Saul, you've been rejected. And the next king that God will choose, now y'all chose this king, but uh, the, 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 the king that God will choose will be a man after God's own heart. In fact, he says, God is looking for a man that is after God's own heart heart. And when you come to chapter 16, we find that that man that God was looking for uh, was the shepherd boy, uh, David. And we find out that David was a man after God's own heart. You say, what does that mean? It means simply this, uh, that that w when you're a man after or a woman or a teenager after God's own heart, it simply means this. It means your life is in harmony with God. It means that what's important to God is important to you. Uh, what God cares about, you care about. Uh, what bothers God, bothers you. It means when God turns right, you turn right. It means when God turns left, you turn left. When God says, stop that, it's wrong, get it out of your life, uh, then you stop it and you get that particular sin or whatever it is out of your life. When God says go, uh, you go. It means that your life is in harmony with God. You're in sync with God. You are in step with God. That's what it means to be a man after God's own heart. That's what it means to be spiritual. You're sensitive uh, to, the, uh, to the Lord. Can I ask you a question today? Very simply, is your life in harmony with God? God. God uses spiritual people. And listen, it takes time to cultivate that kind of relationship with the Lord. But the good news is you can have that kind of relationship with the Lord. God chose David because he was spiritual. And God chooses people today and uses people today that are spiritual. Maybe during this quarantine, you maybe your relationship with the Lord, uh, maybe you uh, you've improved it, and maybe during this time of a uh, downtime and quarantine, you have really uh, gotten closer to the Lord than you ever have before. But maybe I'm um, maybe I'm speaking to some people today uh, who 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 that wasn't the case that wasn't the case for you, and maybe over these past several weeks. Instead of getting closer to the Lord, you've gotten away from the Lord, and now you, uh, your life is no longer in harmony with the Lord. Well, I want you to know I'm not beating you up. I've come to encourage you to say, listen, if that's been the case, then won't you spend some time today uh, getting your, your life back in harmony with the Lord and say, Lord, I've been out of step with you and I've been out of sync with you, but Lord, I want that to change today. And Lord, I want to be an individual, a man, a woman, a teenager uh, that you can use. And Lord, I see from the passage today from 1 Samuel chapter 16 that the first quality that you're looking for in, a, in an individual that you will use is they must be spiritual. And Lord, I want you to use my life. So Lord, would you help me, would you help my life to get back into harmony with you? For in the first reason that God chose David to be the king, I believe was this, because he was spiritual. Let me challenge you today. Cultivate a heart for God. Lord bless you. I hope that this has been an encouragement to you. I look forward in the next two videos and the next two devotions and sharing with you the next two reasons why I believe that God chose David to be the king. Lord bless you. Have a great day.